to church this morning. I'm so glad that you are here. Uh, we are uh, experiencing some little bit of difficulties online. They can hear us, but they can't see us. I don't know, is that good or bad, right? Yeah. <laughs> well, that's all right. You know what, this morning, we've got a lot of things happening this morning, and, and I'm excited about this, is that uh, Dave McElhenney is here. Now, I've go I'm going to give you a challenge. Those who know, don't answer. Those who don't know, try. All ready? How do you spell Dave's last name? Good job. M. <laughs> y at the end, right? Uh, so there you go. Well, that's all you need to know. Um, Dave is with uh, Nehemiah Construction. He does. He works with uh, water wells, and he's going to be telling you all this, but I just want to tell you, he, he drills water wells in northern Kenya. And using the water as a tool through which the living water can be shared with a people that need to hear about Jesus as well. So it's the natural and the spiritual. And what a fantastic opportunity to see that. And, and so that you know, as a church, we help support Nehemiah Construction. So this is something that, that on our missions month, I wanted to make sure you all got a chance to meet those that we support. And Dave is one that we support. Laura, not so much. No, I'm just joking. Um, <laughs> Laura's his wife. Um, but you know what? It is, it's a privilege to be able to hear uh, their stories and hear what God is doing in their lives. And so I just want to encourage you, again, uh, each week we are also saying if you would like to give extra into Nehemiah Construction this week, then you can do that either online, do an e-transfer, and then we will send it all to, all to Nehemiah. Uh, or you can put an envelope in the back noting for Nehemiah construction. You can put it into the uh, offering back there as well. And just to remind you too is don't forget your own tithes and offerings is here as well because we want to continue the ministry to, to share the gospel here in Rocky. So anyway, so that kind of gives you some heads up with that. Uh, in the... The church that we're going to be praying for this morning is the Covenant Christian Reformed Church. And they asked us to please pray that things get back to normal. Praise the Lord, July 1st, we get to come back to normal, as normal as that can be. So that means the coffee pot is back on. Um, yeah, so some are excited about that. Uh, but please pray for things to get back to normal and that the seniors can get out and come to church. You know, sometimes when you have seniors and they're not, they're not able to get out or, or something's going on, you know, it's really hard. And we just want to continue to pray. So we're going to be praying for Covenant Christian Reformed Church this morning. Um, and also, uh, before we go too much farther, happy Father's Day to each one of you who are fathers. You have a privilege to lead your family and to be able to be an example and to pray for them. I was able to, to tell my son-in-law, I said, Happy Father's Day. And I encouraged him because he's dealing with my granddaughter. But, in, <laughs> but <laughs> twofold. But um, the whole thing is, as fathers, we have a privilege. And as spiritual fathers, we also have a privilege to lead and to speak into our kids' lives and to pray over them. So uh, this morning, I'm going to pray for the fathers as well. So I'm going to start, and then we've got a couple things. We've got a campfire slideshow that happened last week, and uh, as well as uh, another announcement concerning what's coming up. Can I also, I know I just, I just found this again, is that uh, starting this Friday, we're going to start praying again over our community. We want to start to pray and believe God to bring breakthrough into people's lives. Do you know that after being locked down for such a long time and they're, they're broken, there's people that are hurting and struggling, and as a church, we want to start to walk and pray. Scripture says in 2 Corinthians 4, 4, that the God of this age has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever so that it cannot see the light of the gospel. This was, again, was stirred in my heart even yesterday as I was just preparing and to, to, to encourage you 
that as we walk the streets of Rocky Mountain House, as we start to walk, that God, that we would pray and say, God, we want to see the blinders taken off. We want to see those where the enemy has blinded the eyes of the unbeliever, that their eyes would be open. God, told, God spoke to Paul and said this, and, and, he, and he testified this before, Pont before um, the governor. He said this. He said, God has sent me to open the blind eyes. This was what God called me to do, is to open blind eyes. And do you know what? We do this as we preach the gospel, as we go, and as we are witnesses in our nation or in our community. So I just want to encourage you, starting this Friday, we are going to meet here at 7 o'clock. And every Friday until our come, our come Alive event that's going to be taking place. Now there's going to be one exception, and that's on the 9th, because that's going to be coming up, and we're going to move it to the Monday. All right? So we will keep you informed, but let's get on the go and let's start praying over our community. Let's start walking the streets. And uh, as you do, we want to start marking the map again and let's just believe God. Amen? Let's believe God for open eyes. Let's believe God that their ears would be open and that they would respond to the gospel. We want to see people saved. We want to see the backslider return. Amen? Amen. All right, well, let's pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege again we have this morning to come and to worship you. Father, you are so worthy of our worship. Father, help us not to forget what you have done in our lives. And we are so thankful for your salvation. And Father, we pray today Lord, over our community, right now we lift it up before you and we say, God, would you come and move in our community? We pray, oh God, for open hearts, open ears, and a willingness to respond to the move of your Holy Spirit in their lives. Father, we pray that their eyes would be open, that, Father, as they hear the message, that they would turn towards you and once again, or, or those that are backslidden, that they once again would turn and they'd draw near and they'd walk after you, that they would experience your presence. Those who don't know you, we pray that they might come to know you and be set free from the brokenness and that they can come back into that place of pursuing that relationship with you, Father. Father, this morning we lift up the Covenant Christian Reformed Church and we pray, oh God, that as they are walking through this, these Oh, these doors that are starting to open up from this pandemic, that God, that you would just uh, encourage even the seniors to be able to come and that they can start to worship again. Father, we pray freedom and direction for them this morning. And Father, we pray that uh, as they start to bring, as normal starts to come back in, that God, that you would help them to transition properly into that. And Father, again this morning, I want to pray for the fathers that are here. And I pray, Lord, and those that are online, I pray, Lord, would you touch their lives. Father, I pray that they would be equipped and in, in, infused with your Holy Spirit. That, Father, that they would know your presence, O oh God, and that they would know the power of the Holy Spirit within their lives. And that they, Father, would lead their families. That they would be the men of God that you have called them to be. Father, I pray for them. And I pray your blessing over their lives this morning. And Lord, uh, for those other requests that have come up, Lord, those that are sick today, Lord, I pray for them. I pray, Lord, healing in Jesus' name. Father, that you would touch their bodies and restore them. Lord, I pray, Father, for that one, uh, that Arthur that's, that is sick right now. Lord, we pray. Lord, first of all, that he would come and he would see you, that he would be encounter a fresh encounter with you, Father, and that, Father, that he would cry out to you and you would touch him, Lord. Lord, bring that healing spiritually and the healing physically. Lord, I pray that you would work uh, in him by your spirit. And all the other requests, Father, today, we just lift them up before you. Lord, have your way in this place and in those lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're going to watch a slideshow that took place just this last weekend. Can we do that? Okay.
All right. Well, from campfire to camp out, we're going to talk about the church camp out. Sweet. One person's going to be there. Awesome. <laughs> Thanks for clapping, Eric. <laughs> Appreciate that, buddy. No, that's good. Um, it's been kind of mentioned the last couple weeks, but we're going to give you some details here. And some of you have already signed up at the back, and that's great. There's a sheet back there and a bit of a schedule page uh, for the weekend. Um, so it's July 9th, 10th, 11th. And um, so it's coming up fairly quick, actually. Pretty exciting if these restrictions get lifted and, and masks and stuff. Um, then we can continue to do the right thing the right way at the camp out and not have to sneak around. So that's good. That's a good thing as a church to not have to break the rules too much. So um, It's at Hank and Don Smith's Family Farm. And we appreciate them volunteering that space. So little did they know I conned them into it. They didn't really volunteer it. I talked them into it. No, they totally volunteered. But So on the Friday, uh, about 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock p.m., we're going to celebrate two. There's no way these people have been married 50 years because they don't look like it. Now, I could have gone the other way on the joke and been like, these really old people are celebrating a milestone. But I'm not going to do that, even though I just said it. But um, <laughs> Hank and Don are celebrating their 50th wedding anniversary this year, and that's fantastic. So, so we're going to partake in that. Um, we're going to go out there as a church and crazy up their family a little bit. Some of their family will be out there for that evening celebrating with them. So we can get to maybe meet some new people. Or if you're uh, friends of the Smith family, then it's a little bit of a reunion for you too. And then a campfire after that night. Then Saturday morning, we're doing a pancake breakfast, which is provided, okay? And then 11 to 1 is kind of free time, your own lunch time, but fellowship, hang out with each other. 1 o'clock, we're going to do knocker ball. If you don't know what knocker ball is, I have these huge balls that you blow up, you climb inside and smash into each other. And it, so there will be counselors on hand to deal with your rage issues after we play knocker ball. So it's going to be good. So, <laughs> so schedule Eric for like 115 for rage counseling. So we're going to do some of that and take out some aggression on each other. And then at 2 o'clock, we're going to play some yard games like uh, bocce ball, that kind of stuff. So if you have those things in your trailer or in your shed or whatever, bring them. The more games, the better. If we use them, we use them. If we don't, we don't. It's just not really scheduled. It's just going to be kind of a time to, to goof around and have a little competition with each other. 3 o'clock is a watermelon feast. We need each family group to bring at least one watermelon, okay? And maybe bring two because the Robodeau family, those kids <laughs> inhale watermelon <laughs> like it's air. It's ridiculous. We took a watermelon to their house yesterday, and I thought, oh, we'll come home with half of this. Nope. I got my fingers bit even trying to have a piece. So anyway, <clears throat> so let's bring. Oh, no. It was your sister that bit my finger. It was Emma. Anyway. All right, so we're going to do that about 3 while the yard games are going on. 5.30 is B-Y-O-S-T-T-C. Bring your own supper to the campfire. That's what we're going to do. So go make your stuff, then let's come back to the campfire and let's eat together. And then have some group games, and then again another campfire sing-along time in the evening. So bring your cajon, bring your maracas, bring your finger symbols, Hank. Bring your finger symbols please. And we'll have a little campfire sing-along thing. And then Sunday morning is church at 1030, potluck at 1, and we'll finish up whatever the Robodeau kids didn't eat for watermelon. We'll finish that up at 3 o'clock on Sunday afternoon. And then hang out for the afternoon. If you got to go, you got to go, but there's no checkout time. We can stay the rest of the summer at the Smith's house. They volunteered. <laughs> we can all move in. They were like, no problem. The more the merrier. So stay as long as you want. So with that, um, please sign up at the back. We just need some numbers so we know how many trailers are coming. We need numbers for the breakfast so, so we have enough pancakes and that kind of a thing. And then just in closing, I'm just going to say, <clears throat> in speaking to Hank, we would prefer if no dogs came. But if you're going to bring your dog, that's okay. You clean up after your dog. So if I step in anything... I'll flip a coin, and heads or tails, I'll clean my shoe off with your coat or your pillow, whatever you want me to do. So, no, we just want to clean up after the dogs if they're out there and stuff, okay? So, uh, but I'm serious about the cleanup, for sure. No. 
No, so it's going to be an awesome weekend, so come expecting just have fun and participate. And you have a question, Caitlin? <laughs> oh, we'll know. Well, we'll default with Trevor, and we'll go from there. We'll work our way down. So, All right, so that's the church camp out. Yeah. Yes, they do. Please have them on a leash. No one running around. Uh, you know, keep your kids on a leash too. <laughs> Robodos if you need to. Um, bring your harnesses. Bring your child harnesses. So, yeah, we're looking forward to the camp out. It's going to be a lot of fun, guys. So sign up, and we'll go from there. Do we have the 40-day prayer and fasting video to put on? Okay. Well, I'll start with mine ahead of time then. So the prayer focus for this coming up week is power and authority. And there's lots of scripture to look at for this coming up week. And one of the scriptures that they have to pray over is Zechariah 4, verse 6, which is one of my favorites. And it's not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. We just have to be in prayer and obedient, and the Holy Spirit does all the work. In Acts 16, verse 6, the Holy Spirit told them not to go into the province of Asia. We don't know how the Holy Spirit told Paul they should not go into Asia. It may have been through a prophet, a vision, conviction, or circumstance. To know God's will doesn't mean we have to audibly hear his voice. He leads us in different ways. When you are seeking God's will, make sure your plan is in harmony with God's word. Ask mature questions for their advice. Check your own motives. Are you seeking to do what you want or what you think God wants? And pray for God to open and close doors as he desires. So I'm um, just, we can pray here. Um, thank you, Lord God, for this day. This is the day you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. I pray as your people we would spend more time in your word and in prayer. I pray that we would be continually drawn into your presence and continually filled with your spirit. We can do nothing of ourselves, but we need your wisdom and leading in everything. I pray against the spirit of pride and fear and show us again, Lord, where you need us to repent of any sins. I pray for the spiritual gifts that the Holy Spirit gives to each one of us. I pray that they would manifest themselves in this church. May each person use their gift to build up the church and give you all the praise and honor for it. I pray that our pastor would constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit and godly wisdom. As Paul said, the kingdom of God is not just fancy talk. It is living by God's power. Thank you, Lord, that greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. In Jesus' name, amen. Friends, we're on uh, week number five, day 29 to 36 of our 40 days of uh, standing in prayer and fasting. It's just been an incredible time. This week's theme is power and authority. And, uh, you know, sometimes we get those two words confused. And I just want you to understand the difference between the two. We know that Jesus has all power and all authority. But what does that mean for your life and for my life? Authority really is the right to rule and power is the might to rule. And so for us to understand that, just think of a police officer, if you're speeding and he pulls you over, he has the authority to issue you a ticket. But if you refuse to stop, he may not have the power to stop you. And so really we could get into the whole thing of what the authority of the believer is and the power that we have through Christ our Lord. But more I wanna talk about what is the purpose of power and authority. We know that uh, the Word of God teaches us that 
that uh, God's desire is that the kingdom of God would come and bear upon the kingdoms of this world, to, to bring transformation to the kingdoms of this world. We know that through Jesus' prayer when he said, Father, let your kingdom come and let your will be done on earth as it already is in heaven. And so, you know, what, what is God's will? What was God's intention? For us to understand the, the meaning and the use of power and authority in the kingdom of God, we need to understand God's intention toward mankind. You see, you and I were created with an incredible identity. We are created as in the image of God. We we're created to have this amazing relationship with God. And we were created to have this incredible purpose, living for the glory of God and for the good of mankind. But of course, we know that sin came in and just devastated God's good intentions. We know that the image of mankind became marred. We know that our relationships became threadbare and broken. And we know that, that uh, our purposes became deeply misguided. Rather than, than living my life in the service of others, I decided to take dominion over others so they could serve me, which was never God's intention or heart. And so really understand that power and authority have come back to the church and to the believer in order to restore God's intended purposes in this world. We know that, of course, when we start to study uh, Jesus' words when he was giving us the Great Commission. He said, all authority has been given to me on earth and in heaven, everywhere I have it all. So what are we supposed to do then? He said, go and make disciples of all nations. Amen? Teaching them to obey, teaching them to follow me, being baptized, following God, and let them know that I am with them always. And this is really the intent of what God designed and desired the power of the kingdom of God for. You see, you and I were created not so that I could have authority over others so they could serve me, but so I could have authority over myself so that I could serve others. And this is God's good intention. When I live as a disciple of Jesus Christ, I invite others to join me in that discipleship process. And this is what God wants to do with his power and authority in our world today. So this week as you're praying, pray for God to uh, pour out his power and his authority on and through the church in order that more and more people can find their way home to God and live as disciples who care in this world. And, and pray that you and I will be filled with a measure of the fullness of the Holy Spirit, that the gifts of the Spirit will be in operation in our world today so that we can see God's kingdom come and God's will be done. He wants to restore people's identity. He wants to bring them back into a right relationship with himself and with others. And he wants to bring us all into the great purposes of God, living for the glory of God and for the good of mankind. God bless you as you stand this week. All right, just before we uh, engage in musical worship to God here, we just want to talk just quickly about next Sunday. Um, we've been talking about deeper, and we talked several weeks ago. We made an announcement, and there was a, a desire to have some additional worship time and some additional time pressing in, fellowshipping with each other, as well as pressing into God. So we're going to do that next Sunday at 1 o'clock. Uh, after church so what we're going to do is do our normal service and then if you need to go out and grab lunch or bring a lunch with you we're going to have lunch and then at one o'clock we're going to start so because we're in the middle of this um, 40 days of praying and fasting if you can fast lunch next Sunday think about doing that pray about doing that um, I don't know about, I, like I don't fast well I'm I have I'm hypoglycemic, so I get low blood sugar really easily. So um, fasting doesn't work great for me, but I have been able to um, get out and take some long walks for prayer times and things like that the last few weeks, and that's been fantastic. So it doesn't have to look the same for everybody, but um, it's just an opportunity that if maybe you haven't had a chance to do a bunch of fasting this, this last few weeks, this is an opportunity to do it right before we jump in. So just so 
you kind of understand what we're doing. Um, over this next week, folks, please be praying for this deeper event. Please be preparing your own heart to go deeper with God. So be praying um, not just for the actual time that we do it, but be praying through some things in your own life, getting your heart prepared, coming to this event ready and expecting the Holy Spirit to move. I think a lot of times we just kind of stand and wait for the Holy Spirit and hope he comes. Well, he's here, but we want him to manifest his presence. We want him to change us. So if that's your heart, let's prepare that heart over the week. So it's not hard to do. Let's just be in prayer. Let's just be in conversation with God. Let's be in the word, and let's prepare to do this. So this is um, not our normal Sunday service deeper, okay? So we're going to do our Sunday service. You know how Sunday mornings sometimes it's hectic to get to church, and it's like, ah, and you're running late or whatever, and maybe it's a little stressful. And we get here, and we sing a couple fast, you know, toe-tapping songs, and we kind of get into worship. We're going to already have done that for Sunday morning. So what we're planning to do is at 1 o'clock, we're going to pray, we're going to read some scripture, and we're going to step off the cliff and go deeper with God. That's what we want to do. So come prepared to do that, okay? So um, hopefully everybody um, will attend. I mean, everybody's welcome to do so. And if you don't feel it's for you or whatever, that's okay as well. But let's pray that out and let's come and, and jump in deeper with God next week, okay? Well, let's, let's stand and let's uh, pray, and then we're going to worship God this morning. Thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we thank you, Heavenly Father, for this morning. We thank you for an opportunity to come together and fellowship God. Hallelujah for human beings <laughs> standing in the same room. Lord, we thank you that even through the last year and a half, God, you have been faithful. You have been reaching people. You have been doing things and working mightily in people's lives all around this world. And Lord God, we want to worship you this morning. God, we want to celebrate who you are this morning together as believers. Lord God, would you help us to do that this morning? Would you help all the distractions to go away? Would you help the things of the week or the things of tomorrow or this afternoon just melt away? And may we enter your presence this morning willingly. Holy Spirit, we thank you for an opportunity to come this morning. Holy Spirit, would you manifest your presence in this service this morning? Would you speak through us and to us, Lord? In Jesus' name we ask. Amen.
Open the eyes. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Yes, I want to see you. Open my eyes, Lord. It's brilliant. 
this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. That you would take my place, that you would bear my cross, you laid down your life, that I would be set free, oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. set free oh Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me Jesus I sing for all that you've done for me this is amazing grace this is unfailing love that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You laid down your life, then I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Jesus, I sing. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me.
Oh, I surrender. 
día Can have a seat. Amen. I was hesitant to share this, but uh, as we worshiped, I felt that God was taking me into this throne room and I heard the angels. I said, 
What is my voice? Who am I? God said to me, he said this, you are my son, and I love to hear your voice. And it so touched my heart to know he loves your voice. Because you do it out of a willing heart. I don't know if you can even sense what that looks like or how it feels, but I'm so thankful that I've been able to worship this morning in this way with you. We're going to just... Uh, Pray for the kids as they're going to go to Sunday school and we're going to welcome Dave up. So uh, let's just pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we've had to worship you. Lord, you are worthy. You are worthy in all our ways. Father, this morning as we continue, God, I just pray, Lord, that you bless the Sunday school. Lord, as these kids go and they hear about you, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you meet with them and that you reveal yourself to them, Lord, in a new way. Lord, I just pray your blessing upon them this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, you kids can go to Sunday school. We're going to get Dave to come on up. And uh, for those of you who don't know Dave, Oh, you better yeah, take the the cover off, isn't it? Yeah. If you don't know Dave, this is Dave. This is his back, and I'm so glad he's back. Uh, then if he turns around, he's here looking forward. <laughs> and so uh, it's, hopefully this is going to work. Does this need to be on? No? Okay. You can really mess with somebody's stuff if you're sitting right here. No. So uh, let's just welcome Dave this morning to come and share with us. Test. Oh, there we are. There we are. Just the technology is wrong. So, I'll just take a second get my PowerPoint going here. My name's uh, Dave McElhenney, capital M-C, capital E-L-H-I-N-N-E-Y, and there'll be a test on it after. So... <laughs> Okay, here we go. So this is my wife, Laura, down here for anybody's a beautiful blonde lady down below. And uh, we have uh, two kids and six grandkids. We all live in Medicine Hat, so it's really nice to have your grandkids around with you all the time. But you can send them home. So that's good, too. Uh, I just wanted to share um, a, a testimony. Uh, I call it a walk in faith. And everybody's looks different and stuff like this. And uh, for Laura and I, like, I, I, Laura got saved before me. I got saved 26 years ago. And 25 years ago, we were in the mission field. And so that's how quickly God works. And one of the things when I got saved, I, 
I said just a child, childlike prayer about, God, if you ask me to do something, I will say yes. And sort of um, that's uh, the way I've went through my whole, the whole ministry, and God has been faithful, but we have to say yes. And so uh, I'm going to jump forward. You know, we got saved, and we were out in Hinton. We went into the mission field. When we came back from the mission field, we were uh, in Australia for just about, uh, just about three years, two and a half years, somewhere in there. And uh, we felt that we were supposed to move to Medicine Hat. And again, it's one of those things. I don't know anybody in Medicine Hat, but we said yes. And so we moved to Medicine Hat, and we knew one other couple. They had moved down there just uh, shortly before us, and uh, they were going to work with YWAM. And so we went down there, and, you know, we thought, well, this is where we're going to build our new home or get, get established again because we had sold everything. We had lived in Kelowna, in Hinton, Stony Plain area. And so this was going to be our new place of uh, residence. We didn't know what that looked like at the time. And so we started looking for houses, and we, uh, because we had been out of the country and... Uh, um, 9-11 had happened, when we got back, basically, we were nobody. Uh, the, the banks wouldn't look at us. I had to reapply and prove who I was to get a driver's license again. Like, it was just craziness. And uh, so uh, the banks wouldn't even look at us for a mortgage, even though we had, we had sold out in Hinton, and we had bas basically been doing our missions on our own dime. And uh, we had a little bit of support, but not much. And so when we got back, we thought, well, we better establish ourselves and, 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 and get a house. But we went to bank after bank after bank. They wouldn't even look at us. They said, well, you have no credit. We don't know how, who you are, and even though we had a big lump sum for a down payment. And so we prayed, you know, God, what should we do? And there was a, a, a new startup company in Medicine Hat, and uh, we went to listened to them, and we basically invested our money. We thought within five years we could have enough to pay cash. Well, even though we felt God said, yes, do that, so we, don't, we don't know the reasons why, right? God's all-knowing. And uh, we, we went, and uh, it went bankrupt. We lost everything. We were penniless. We didn't have any money. We had big credit card bills. And about... Four months after that, God started speaking to me in his, in his own way, in his small voice. And uh, he said, Dave, I'm going to give you and Laura a new home. And so at this time, you know, I'd been saying yes all along. And now I'm mad because I'm thinking, God, you're all knowing. Like, that's what I've been taught. You're all knowing and you care about everything. You can't see my bank account. I have nothing. We are broke. And uh, so it went on. You know, I'm arguing back and forth with God. And so one day I go to a prayer meeting. I hadn't told anybody. I think I had told Laura. And both of us, I mean, we're both figuring this just doesn't make sense. It, it can't be. We don't have any money to build a home. So we get to this... Uh, meeting, prayer meeting, I, I'm there, it's a men's prayer meeting, and there's a guy named Pete Benzler, he's always late for everything, well, we started praying, and all of a sudden, Pete walks in, I still hadn't told anybody, not even the pastor, and uh, we start praying, and Pete jumps right in, he starts to pray, and he said, he stops, and he said, Dave, and he points right at me, he said, God wants you to know he's going to give you and Laura a house. No, he said a home. That the exact words that I heard. And I never told a soul. And so right then I, just like I'm doing now, I get emotional. I'm thinking, okay, well, how can this be? We are, our bank account is this, our credit cards are way over. And uh, so I just kept praying about it and I kept praying about it. And I didn't know how it was supposed to work. And so it just kept on. And one day, our pastor, we had just started Nehemiah Construction Ministries. And so this was uh, 18 years ago. 
And uh, we had just started Nehemiah Construction, and uh, the pastor that we were under, the church umbrella, he come and, and uh, he says, well, let's go for lunch and we'll talk. So we talked about Nehemiah and this and that. And just when we were getting up to leave, he said, so Dave, what's going on? Has God been speaking to you anymore? And I said, you know, Ian, I says, I can't explain it. I said, it's just right here, but I can't explain it. I don't know what's going on. And he says, well, let's pray. So we prayed. So we prayed right there at, at, uh, in the restaurant. And where I was working at the time was right across the parking lot. So I walked back to the parking lot. And there's a guy standing there I'd never met before. And he comes to me and he says, I'm, I'm a partner with, with Stuart, who's a friend of mine. And we're doing this, the, the renovation that I'm doing, right? And he said, uh, do you think I could talk to you for a minute? And I said, well... You're paying me, so you can talk to me as long as you want. So, so we go and we sat. We got the whole building torn apart. We sit on a couple of five-gallon pails. And he says, Dave, he says, I just wanted to talk to you. He said, my wife and I have been praying, and Stuart sort of told me your story a little bit. He says, we've been praying, and we, we believe that God is telling us to help you get into a new home. Same words again. And I'm, I just broke down. I said, well, I don't know what that means. God has been speaking to me about that for about six months now. But I says, be honest, I have zero. I, I can't. There's no money. I don't know how to do it. And he says, well, I don't know neither. He said, but we got to take a step forward. And so that's what we started doing. I come home and told Laura the story, and she said, I don't know how this is supposed to work, but we'll just say yes, and we move forward. So we started looking for a plan. We found a plan. Then we didn't, uh, we didn't have a lot. We were looking around Medicine Hat, and all the lots, you know, they got all this land around Medicine Hat, and the lots are so small, you, you know, you can't even talk to your wife in your house, and the neighbors hear what you're saying. So, so, uh, Jerry says to me, he says, well, you know what? I got a friend that's doing some developing out in Dunmore, which is just east of uh, Medicine Hat. He said, I'll just give him a call. So this Peter Wild, another guy I didn't know, he phones me up. He says, yeah, he says, uh, Jerry told me about you. He said, uh, I'm developing a bunch of lots out in Medicine Hat or out in Dunmore. He said, uh, why don't you come out and pick whatever lot you want? What? And he says, yeah, he says, pick the lot you want. And he says, you can pay me whenever you can pay me. Wow. So we started building the house. And it's, I'll tell you what, it's harder than you think using somebody else's money and not knowing how this is ever going to end. Am I going to end up in so much debt that, do you know what I mean? Like, it's, it was just crazy. But I said, okay, yes, God, we'll just move slowly forward. So we start building. And, uh, you know, the first week we're digging a basement, and we're doing a basement, and that's expensive. And I said to Jerry, I said, you know, I, I need, I need $30,000. He says, okay, yeah, it'll be in your bank Monday morning, pay your bills. And, like, we didn't, we didn't have a contract, we didn't have nothing. All he said was, write down your expenses on a piece of loose leaf paper so we can tell what, where you are. And I said, okay, so that's what I did. The next week was, uh, you know, 15000 Next week was 50000 no, Money's in the bank. So we, we get this house built, and we're thinking, oh, wow. Like, this is a beautiful house. And we're doing the finishing. And uh, I had ordered uh, laminate flooring. I had it sitting in the garage warming up so that, you know, you s I'm going to start putting it in on Monday. This was a Friday. And uh, I, I told Jerry, I says, yeah, I got the, got the flooring. We're going to start putting in. He says, well, you know, I think you should put hardwood in. You know, for resale value, hardwood is definitely going to be better than laminate. Uh, are you sure? And he said, yeah, no. The money's there, just do it. So I took all the laminate back. I got hardwood, put the hardwood floor in. Now we're ready to move in, but because we had gone into missions, basically we did a grad sale, but I don't like grad sales because everybody just wants everything for free, so we just gave it away anyways. <laughs> so... We didn't have a washer, dryer, fridge, nothing. And so I'm, I talked to Laura, and I says, you know, what do we, you know, what do, we do? Our credit cards are maxed out. And so I, I phoned Jerry, and I said, you know, 
you and Sybil have been so generous. I said, I feel terrible even asking you, but like, we don't have any money to buy appliances. And he said, well, he said, just go buy them and let me know how much they are and they're, well, they're paid for. So I hang up the phone and all of a sudden the phone rings and I answer it and don't buy cheap ones. And he, <laughs> and he hangs up the phone. And so, long story short, here we said yes, we didn't understand a thing, uh, we lost all our money, but we still said yes, we didn't understand a thing, and we just kept moving forward slowly by slowly, poly poly, right? And that's Kenyan, or Swahili. So we just kept moving slowly forward, and in the end, uh, here we had, a, we had more equity in that house than when we started out our original missions trip. And, and that was in six months. So I'm thinking, wow, this is just incredible how God works. Just say yes. And that's what I've done ever since. And God has been faithful step by step. Nehemiah Construction Ministries, like I said, we started in uh, 2004. And uh, I didn't know where it was going to go. You know, we went out to the, to the desert to build a, to build a uh, community center, and it only took me a little while to figure out, like, three days. They don't need more buildings. They need water. And so about two years ago, God was speaking to me about the ripple effect. And, you know, we talk about throwing a, a rock into the lake, and the ripples just basically go for on and on and on. And so one day I would just scroll. There is some good things on Facebook. Uh, so one day I was scrolling through there and I saw the ripple effect. And you never know when the small things you do will be what God uses to do great things. And that spoke to me just absolutely incredible. Because, you know, at first, you, you, know, you just, we're just going to build a community center. But really, what are you doing? You're, you're speaking into people's lives, and uh, hopefully you're going to see change in their lives. And that's what's happened. Every little step that we've taken to come alongside, you see the ripple effect. And that's what I want to talk to you about this morning. And by the way, you guys are part of the ripple effect. Your church has been supporting us for 10 years, at least 10 years. And... Uh, you know, I just, I, I find it when I come here, it's like coming at home, coming home. Uh, last weekend I was in Saskatchewan, and it's like coming home. You're, you're welcome in all these different lands, but your well, medicine hat, I hardly ever get a chance to speak. <laughs> Go figure. So uh, the reason that we got there, we started was uh, contaminated water and uh, trying to figure this out. And this woman basically... She is, uh, this was the start of it all. I had two businessmen with me from Medicine Hat, and uh, I was just showing them what we were doing. And we are driving through a place called Lokachogio, and this woman uh, is in the middle of the road, and I knew what she was doing, but they had no clue, so I just, I was driving, I said, just somebody hand me a camera, and I, as I drove by, I just clicked a picture and kept driving. I didn't want to bring shame to her or anything else. But that is actually sewage water that's leaking out of a guest house just on the other side of the the road and she's in the middle of the road collecting sewage water in to take it home to her family because in her mind it's liquid and it'll save my children's lives so that's how we got started the early days well Stuart came home he raised uh, seventy five thousand dollars in one evening and uh, we bought our equipment the bad thing is, Stuart, he wanted to be involved in the purchasing the equipment, and I figured that out, is you don't let an accountant buy equipment. <laughs> so there's a lesson for everybody. Sorry for you accountants here. but So, yeah, we didn't make it very far. The tractor, we got uh, 15 kilometers out of load wire, and we had it torn apart. We had to pull all the brakes out of it, everything, because it was seized right up. So then we're driving out. Good thing we were in the sand because we didn't need brakes anymore. <laughs> and uh, we got to the drill site and we started drilling and the engine went out after six meters of drilling. So, 
but God is good, and uh, I came home, and uh, I, I, I'm a heavy duty mechanic by trade. I went to Cummins, the place that I hadn't worked in probably six years, and I said, this is what I'm doing now. Would you guys be able to help us out with an engine? You never know the answer unless you ask the question. And so I asked the question, and within two hours, I had an engine from $14,000 to $2,000, and I made one call, paid for it, and we were on our way. I shipped it to Kenya, and uh, we put it in, and we've been drilling ever since. We retired this rig, but we got a, a newer and better one, which Doug and Bill were, had their hand in fixing. I think they shared those stories. So everything that we do, like I've been doing missions now for 25 years, and uh, right from the very start, I, I started to, I guess, question how we were doing missions. A lot of people, how are they doing missions? And, and so many times I just see them, they, they just run into a country and they sp throw thousands and thousands of dollars everywhere, but nobody's accountable for what's happening. And so we didn't want to be like that with Nehemiah Construction. We wanted to take people with us that... Uh, have something to give back, some training. So a welder, Doug's taught our, our young driller how to weld. And uh, Bill, just he just mentored, mentored these young guys that we're working with. And that's what it's about, is give them something. It's not really money that they need. It's, it's education. It's somebody to come alongside them, especially in Turkana. Uh, Turkana, like the boys, the second, third, fourth, they have no opportunity whatsoever. They're, in their dad's eyes, they're a waste of skin. And so for us to come alongside them and help in whatever capacity we can, uh, and you'll see that, I'll share a little bit more about the ripple effect. So we've, we started, gar in the early days, we started gardens, we uh, built buildings, we taught the, the Turkana people how to take care of their, their pumps when we drilled a well, and how to repair pumps and so we're giving them something that they can use so we started drilling uh, wells in 20, 2007 and then we had all that trouble it, for the first well it took us uh, eight months to finish it because I had to find an engine and get the engine installed and stuff but we did it and it's still running today um, you know the the women walk well, they, and they still, like, in all fairness, they still walk 20 to 30 kilometers uh, for water, but now they're getting clean water. And then there is a lot of villages that, that spring up around the wells, and so a well that is producing enough water, well, it's producing enough water, but there's, it's supplying water for 300 people, but all of a sudden there's 1,200 people using that water. So there's, uh, you know always that thing that they move towards the water and so now you've got to drill wells even five kilometers apart right but they're they're more than willing to walk so this is the our newest drilling rig and and that was 2019 right 2019 that uh doug and bill came with me to to start putting this new rig together it came out of a, a shipping crate and we we put it all together and, and got it running, and it is just, it's so much faster, better uh, to operate than our old one. Uh, last year, uh, 2020, in the midst of COVID, we didn't know how anything was going to work, but we said yes. The whole team said, yes, we're going to go and we're going to drill water wells. Well, they drilled 20 water wells last in 2020. That's, uh, let's see, that's 14 more than we'd ever done in our best year. So, no. Yeah, 14 more. So that was incredible. And then now we're fixing, we're getting more and more efficient. So even when we're drilling, we send two or three guys out to repair other wells. So it's just that ripple effect, right? You train your people up, and now you can do more, and you train more people. And so this is, uh, um, our, this is our equipment now. So, you, you know, you picture the, the picture before and after picture, that old tractor broken down on the road with an old drill with an engine gone out of it. So this is what God has brought us. 
uh, you know, uh, and it's all this equipment is basically out of a church in Virginia. Go figure, somehow uh, Larry spoke in a little tiny church and somebody heard his message and he said, I'm taking this back to my elders and uh, basically they have donated all this equipment for us to get going and doing better. And uh, it's just, again, the ripple effect. Now we have people in Virginia and we have people in Oklahoma and we have all uh, people in Alaska. All these people are jumping on board because they see the value in, in what we do. So the ripple effect, some of you have probably heard this story in the beginning, but I want to share, expand on it. So this is Laura Philemon, and this is Chief Amos. Basically, he's one of the highest chiefs in Turkana, and uh, he's, a, he's a good friend of mine. And uh, one day we were sitting having breakfast, uh, myself and Gary Lemire, he's on my board, and uh, we were sitting having breakfast at Christine's, and uh, Chief Amos comes to me, and he's telling me a story about this young boy. And as it turns out, Lar, he was uh, in a, lived in a village called Labanga, and he saw us drilling his water well uh, when he was nine years old, I think it was, in his village. And so his, his desire was to go to nursing school. He had finished high school. He had four siblings, but none of, none of them could go to school because it, his mother could only afford one. So she put him through school. And then Lauer, he, he felt, if I can, well, he said, if those guys can come from across the world to drill my village a, a water well, why can't I go to school and come back and help my people? And so now he's a nurse. We paid, basically, long story short, uh, we paid for his education. And uh, he's, he's a nurse. And this was just in 2020 when we were there with Bill last uh, January, February. And so he graduated. He was working in Labanga. And he was doing such a great job that the, all the chiefs and the elders in the area uh, said, we want to give you a bigger area. So now instead of, you know, maybe helping 1,000 people, he's helping 25,000 people. So that ripple effect just keeps going and going and going. And, you know, at the time, again, I didn't think that we were going to, we were doing anything special. We were just, this kid wanted to be a nurse, and we thought, well, you know, he'll help one or two people or three or four people, right? But we didn't, we're not thinking big enough what God is going to do. He's going to do great things. Um, Achum, we put him through an agricultural school, and he did, he did a pretty good job. He's no longer with us because he uh, found a wife, and he's off busy doing something else now. So <laughs> go figure. And then this is Florence. Florence is just a gem. Again, we found her. Um, she was at one of Pastor Wilson's churches, and we were listening to her story one day. And she said, uh, yeah, she said, I'm trying to finish my education, but she said I, this last year my, my father died. And so she said my education is, is basically, I, have, I had the money to finish my last year, but I found four boys that had finished um, uh, junior high, but when you go from junior high to high school, you have to pass a provincial test, and that costs the equivalent of about $20 Canadian or $25 Canadian, and most parents can't afford that, so they're done. They're done their education. So she came along, she said, I thought I can educate four boys or I can go to school and finish my school. I chose to help these boys. Ripple effect. And so that's what she did. So when we found her, we said, what's one more year of college? And she told us, and we said, well, get registered. We'll pay your way. And it was the best move that we did, one of the best. Um, so this is Florence. She finished her school in com community development. And so this is her gardens. And what she's done is she's gone out to a remote village about... Um, it's probably about 120 kilometers away from her home, 
and she goes out there Monday to Friday to teach women. The, f this, uh, f the first time when we had the watermelon, she was teaching uh, 50 women, I think it was, 50 women, uh, how to do exactly what she learned to do, and she's training them. And so now they're, they're growing gardens and vegetables, and they're getting them to market, and they're, they're providing for their families. Well, the next time I went there was, uh, I think it was 2019, and she, uh, she rode in on a little 90, 90 uh, scooter thing uh, from the desert, 120 kilometers, to greet me at the airport because she knew I was flying in and she come for five minutes and she said, Dave, she said, thank you for what Nehemiah has done for me. She said, now I'm teaching uh, 150 women how to do exactly what I was taught to do. But that's not good enough for Florence. <laughs> so she goes and she's coming, she comes into church every Sunday and this is a new church uh, that Pastor Wilson has planted. And uh, it's right in the, the lowest, the scummiest, whatever you want to call it, drugs, prostitutes, uh, everything. And I mean, it's, the whole economy there is, is bad, but this is really, really bad. And Wilson just felt this is where God wants us to be. So he started ministering there. And he had a little piece of land, and uh, the, you know, the drunks would come, and the prostitutes would come to the church, and they would listen, and more, a lot of times they would just sleep in the church, so, it, you know, that was all right, too. They were quiet. They weren't disrupting anything, but it started to, they started to hear the message, and so they wanted to come, and they, how do I get to know Jesus better, and Wilson said to him, I guess it was a guy thing. We we're trying to always fix things, right? And, and, and he said, well, you know, you shouldn't really sell your body if you're going to call yourself a Christian. And she said, well, how can, I, how can I take care of my kids? Like, she's got four or five kids and no husband. And so Florence stepped in and said, Wilson, you can't, you can't just tell them they can't do that. You have to do something else, right? So Florence did some investigating. She said, give me two weeks. I'll figure something out. So she learned uh, basket weaving, and she found some ladies in the area that were Christians, and they could mentor these, these prostitutes and alcohol, uh, alcoholics and, and drug addicts. And so when we came back last January, yeah, last January with Bill, um, she, she come to me, and she said, we started in September 20, uh, 2019, and she had seven girls that she was teaching this was January, and now it was up to 35 women that she's teaching. So now this woman is teaching 185 women how to care for their families, take care, how to run a small business. And all we did was invest in one year of education for her. So you think now, that's, that's the ripple effect. We're not thinking big enough. When God asks you to do that little thing, do it with an open heart, open mind. You don't know where it's going to go, but if God has his hand in it, it's going to go somewhere. So these guys, this picture was taken 18 years ago, first, my first trip. And uh, today, the only, the, so we've got a 75% average. Robert on the, the far left, uh, he's, he's still with us. He's one of our drillers. And uh, he's been working with the team faithfully. His integrity is beyond compare with anybody. It's just, he's just amazing. He doesn't speak a whole bunch of English, but uh, when I get there, I, I know what he's saying. Um, Colo, the next guy to him, he's the only guy I don't know what happened to. He sort of fell under, uh, and uh, so I've never seen him again. But the next guy is John. John is one of our... He's a pastor of one of the churches, and he also leads our Jesus video uh, project. So everywhere the drill goes, the Jesus video project goes, and they share the gospel in those villages. And even with COVID, like, um, the, you know, they, they had guidelines. They were supposed to do this. They were supposed to, you know, 
do this well. How do you tell people with no education, they can't read, they, they don't listen to the news, uh, that the church is closed? Well, I can guarantee you, the church wasn't closed. Uh, it grew and it grew and it grew. And they're busting out every church that we've helped build. They've already had to expand it. Uh, uh, the last guy is Pastor James. And Pastor James, he started in a rock quarry. Uh, like after we left, we set him up and we got him a hammer and a chisel. And that's all he needed. He went out and he'd pound sto uh, stones, building stones out of a granite wall. And he'd break them all up and build his stones. And uh, he'd sell them. And then he, uh, he became a pastor and he has a church way out in the bush. And so he's, he's sharing the gospel. Um, there's, we've been with Pastor Wilson. Basically, we've come alongside him and through that, uh, and the, you know, drilling the water wells and the Jesus videos team, we've helped to um, start 65, between 60 and 65 churches. You know, some of them are still in their infancy under a tree somewhere. I was at one uh, when we were their last, uh, I was three, four weeks ago now, uh, in Nanya. So the ripple effect here, this is a, another story. That's uh, the first picture. That's a little boy named Ekimat. He was, I think he was seven. He says he was eight, but I think he was seven. And uh, we met him the very first trip. And we sort of, you know, he, he grew on, he was, a, he was a naughty little boy, but he grew on us. And uh, we've, we've kept our eye on him the whole time, and Pastor Wilson. And so I was just so impressed. Every time we go, he comes and he's, you know, if he's around, he'll come and say hi to me. But he's, he was very shy and, and stuff. And so this time, uh, he's, he was living with Wilson because he had such a terrible broken arm. And they were just going to let his arm stay like that. It was broken off, basically hanging like this. And it had healed that way. So we raised the money to, to repair his arm. And he lived with Wilson in that time. And Wilson and Alice had really ministered to him. And so I was so excited this time. I see him. He's 25 years old now. And uh, he come and he, to surprise me, we were in, in uh, Kakama. And he comes and he just stands beside me to see if I would recognize him. I'm, I'm, I'm looking at Eki Matt. And he, and he just smiled. And he, he said, uh, I'd like to travel with you. I'd like to go to the bush with you today. I said, no problem. We've got an extra seat. So he came out to the bush, and we were speaking in a bush church. And uh, I needed a translator. And bang, Ekimat, he jumped up. Now he's translating for me. You don't know what God is going to do. And I believe this young boy is going to be instrumental in the moving on of Nehemiah. Church growth, like I said, it's, it's just crazy. Every church is growing. Um, this is a, on the left-hand side is a, a Muslim lady that wandered in, their, in the church service one day. And all the only English word or Swahili, or whatever she was saying, was, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I need, and so Pastor Wilson took her aside, and he had, to, yeah, you have to be really careful because they send spies. Like, it's, it's quite, uh, there's quite a Muslim uh, influence up there. But she was sincere. She needed Jesus. And so he led her to the Lord, and, and she's a faithful member in their, one of their churches. Uh, one of the things that Pastor Wilson did <laughs> Uh, this was a f quite a few years ago now. Uh, he s started going into the refugee camp and sharing the gospel with some Muslims one at a time. And so when uh, it sort of calmed down in Somalia, they went back to Somalia and they planted... There's two churches, Christian churches, in Somalia now because of what Pastor Wilson was able to do. And then this is uh, one of the... Uh, elders in, in a village, and he gave his life to the Lord. And that's very uncommon for, for a, a man in Turkana culture because they are the king. There is no one higher than them. But, so when they submit and they, they bow down to Christ and the lordship of Jesus, uh, it's just 
the whole village usually comes to Jesus and they want a church. So um, the Jesus video on the left-hand side, basically, uh, the guys uh, in the evening, they have a screen and they set up, it's called PVC, they put it together and they go out and they share the Jesus video in the Turkana language for, uh, you know, anybody's there. And usually uh, two, three, four hundred people will show up and they'll watch a Jesus video and then they share the gospel. And like I said, when they, when the drilling rig leaves and the, the Jesus video team leaves, the next question is, when are you coming to start a church, right? And so it's, it's a great problem to have, but we need more leaders. We need, that. We need you guys to be praying to raise up leaders. Um, on the side there, the, it's always exciting to have a baptism in, uh, in Turkana because it hardly ever rains. There's no water laying around anywhere. And so when it rains, Wilson says, we're going to have a baptism. And so this, this one was... Uh, in 2020, uh, November, I think it was, and it had rained, very unusual, and uh, for November, and so I think they were supposed to baptize 20, and 35 people showed up to get baptized, so uh, it's just a wonderful thing. So then uh, on May 2nd, it was my mistake, I, th I, I know it was probably Wilson's English, but I'll call it his fault, not mine. So I thought I was going to be there for this the baptism. Uh, baptism. He said we're having a baptism, and it was on the second, and I arrived on the ninth, and uh, stuff. But they again they were supposed to baptize twenty five, and this time sixty people showed up to be baptized. So that's that's the growth that we're talking about. It it's just incredible. The churches. Uh, uh, basically, this is the, the Kakama church. This is the new one. And uh, this was, it was a little bit further. Oh, no, Kakama church. Okay. And this is the Lodwar church. This is the one that they just planted. And uh, when Bill was there, they just had a, a frame and a roof over it. And it was basically full to capacity. And then over this last year, uh, 2020, I was able to raise some money and uh, send it to them, and so they've they've got it just about finished. And because of what uh, Pastor Wilson has done within that community, working with the kids and working with the the prostitutes and the, and the drug addicts, now the elders in the village, they said, "Thank you for bringing this church here. We need we need this," and they actually gave him more land attached to their parcel so that now they can, they're going to actually turn this into the Sunday school and office and they're going to build a bigger sanctuary because they already need a bigger sanctuary. So, you know, and then this is the Kakama. I got this flipped out of order. So this is the Kakama church now. It's uh, basically just about done. They've been holding service in it. It doesn't matter if it's finished or not. If there's a floor in it and they're... They, have a, they had a generator, now they're hooked up to power. So they have all their worship in there. And, uh, you know, f for, for us, what's important a lot of times is, uh, you know, maybe new carpet or, or nicer seats in the auditorium and, and stuff. And, and in Kenya, what's important is a baptismal tank. So I sort of, they raise the money. And uh, in the Kakama Church, they have a, uh, a baptismal tank there now that they have water so now they can baptize people whenever they don't have to wait for the rain and so it was uh, it's a great thing to see uh, one of the things that pastor wilson we've been able to mentor him and uh, and help him to understand that you can't just keep looking to the west to bail you out right you have to uh talk to your people and they ha they have to be able to help you help you know give and so that's basically i'll go in and i'll raise two thousand dollars to work on the church but now you guys have to raise something and i don't raise any more money until they've done their share and and it's they're moving along and they're excited about it because they are doing it it's not the west doing it and so all we can do is we come alongside them step by step and just say yes. So this is another church, the Canon Church. 
basically they had to add on before they ever finished it. They added on another 20 feet and it's full to capacity already. They should have added 40 feet, but who knows. God's timing. Um, the, that's the drill. This is in uh, Lockapoo, right? Lockapoo, that's where you were, right? And uh, the, the uh, rig, as soon as it shows up, there's people waiting for water. And they'll wait. They're, they'll come every day. And they're waiting for two, three weeks a lot of times. But they know that there's going to be water. And so they just keep waiting. And then the, the girls that came last year, it was a real blessing. It was a blessing for me to be able to take them. But it was a real blessing for them, too, to see what their, their hard work, what their ripple effect was. And the two girls, they've helped me with a water run for Ava. This is her 12th year helping. And, um, and uh, Michelle, I think this is her seventh year helping. And uh, they always wanted to go, but it, was, it just never worked out, never worked out. And this was a year I took nine people with me. It was one of the best outreaches that we ever had. Everybody got along great. And uh, they were able to minister to children and women. And it was just, yeah, the right timing. Like I said, there's our, our new equipment. And that's, that's the picture that you get every time you pull up to the rig. The people are waiting patiently for water. So this is a property that's been on our hearts for a long time. I wanted a place to be able to, to take, our, take our team and, and uh, um, I guess, have them, have them feel safe. And, uh, you know, a lot of the places in the last... Uh, 18 years, I'm all right, but I, I wouldn't expect everybody to be all right there, just because it is, it's hard, it's, uh, it's dirty, it uh, smells, it's, the food isn't that great unless you eat at Christine's, um, but now we have this haven, and it's, it's nice because uh, when you're out in the field and you never get a break from people, it, it gets really tough. You, you don't get the time to um, rejuvenate, right? And so it, it, this is our new place, and it, it's been a long time coming. This was actually three years ago, and then that was uh, last year when we got there. And then uh, Bill and I and Cody, uh, most that, three of us, we work constantly on the house. Uh, to get to where it, is, it was when we left. And then uh, basically this is sort of how it looks. It's, that's why I went in May. Um, we had, uh, basically we did all the water work, uh, the, the showers, are, we have indoor showers, it's so great. <laughs> and indoor toilets too with sit down, not squatty. So that's, <laughs> it's very exciting. And uh, this is a veranda that faces uh, north, and so you can see, look over the city. Uh, it's, it's just, it's God's timing. It's, God has his hand in everything. And again, uh, the church in Virginia has done this whole property. So it, they've been uh, an, abla uh, 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 an amazing partner to be with. And, uh, but it takes a whole army to do what we're doing, and I'm so happy to be partners with you guys, too. Again, one of the things that uh, was always my concern, I have so many women that want to go and they want to, uh, to minister somehow, and we really didn't have a connection until last year. Uh, we started working with, um, it's an organization called Days for Girls, and uh, when girls have their period, uh, basically, they don't go to school that whole week because they're, they're embarrassed and the, the ridicule and everything. It's because they, don't, they can't take care of themselves. And so um, the girls came and they, we got a whole bunch of these kits and then they had classes. And I think we got 200 kits to start with and we used them up in 
the first three days, I think. And so we were able to get another 200. And uh, that's what the girls did. So they really felt uh, like they accomplished something. And it was really good. The, the young girls, and we even had some of the prostitutes there. And they ministered to them. Um, so you see, it's those little things that we do. And you don't know where God is going to take this. But it is exciting. Uh, feeding, feeding the hungry, that's always a problem. They have droughts and uh, stuff. And again, now we've, we've sort of come together with a bunch of like-minded, small uh, charities, ministries, I guess you would call it, Christian ministries. And uh, like we have trucking equipment now, so uh, we can truck the food. And other people, well, we, have, we don't have any equipment, but we have an excess of food. And so that's what we do now in a, in a time of real drought. We'll deliver tons and tons of food out into the, into the Turkana Desert uh, to help get them through that time. Uh, medical support. Basically, it's a, it's a big thing. We never know. We just lost another one of our workers uh, to AIDS uh, in December. He decided, died uh, December 23rd. And so that was two of our workers in the last two years died from AIDS. And so we, you know, now they have uh, their wives or widows and they have orphans. So we try our best to get them set up in a little business or something to to keep them moving forward and again you guys are part of that small part of that uh, this is Zeddy's and again Zeddy's on in the blue shirt one day he just woke up and he was like this nobody knew what was wrong uh, we finally f figured that it was some kind of a bite and it was an allergic reaction but he was totally blind he couldn't see anything his wife had to lead him around everywhere and we were able to get him to the doctor and, uh, and he also has heart problems. So we've, for the last 10 years, we've been working with specialists in Nairobi to get him the best health care that we can get him. And then uh, even Pastor Wilson's brother standing behind us there, he almost died. Uh, it would be two years ago now. And they operated, and he got infection and stuff. And they even sent him home, imagine this, with his stomach wide open and uh, they had to care for him and take care of him and they nursed him they, yeah, a lot of people were praying but they nursed him back to health and yeah now he's he's working and loving life and he gave his life to the Lord he was he was not a Christian and and stuff and he's he saw God's hand upon him so we get back to the ripple effect just uh, recently about two months ago I got a phone call uh, from Larry, and he had been working with uh, a couple other pastors that work with Pastor Wilson, and and there was a lot of street kids in Kakama, and so they they thought, how can we minister to these kids? And so what they did is they sort of started a little uh, club, I guess, or whatever, and you come out to the church, and we'll do a Bible story, and we'll play some soccer, and you can have a meal. And so a lot of these kids, street kids, they don't have meals. they they're out scrounging through garbage and, and uh, you know, whatever they can find. And so uh, Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday, we do this. And it's grown to uh, up to 30, but usually it's about 20. And within, uh, well, I was there a month ago. So within that, um, the first month, we actually saw a drastic change in the kids. Like they were... They were actually using a, a bit of manners, and uh, one day when we got there, I was out with um, <clears throat> uh, Pastor Wilson and, and the whole team. There was eight of us, I think, and we we're sitting in Christine's, and uh, all of a sudden, these it was 7:30 in the morning, and all of a sudden, these all these kids were coming there, and usually they're very rude and and yeah, unmanageable, and they would just come and they sat on the step. And we, we said, what, hey, what are you guys doing here? And they're waiting. We're waiting for our pastor. And we said, oh, really? Who's your pastor? Ben. 
And so now after a month, they're calling, he's our pastor. And so what happens there is, as he pulls up, he says, you guys just stay here and I'll come and pick you up. And his, he's got one of those little Suzuki's, not a samurai, the next one bigger, but it's really small. And he puts 18 kids and he takes them to church. And so, you know, we, we look at these and these are, you know, they're just a bunch of street kids. They're filthy, dirty, they're rude, they're obnoxious. But what plan does God have for them? And I think... You know, a lot of times we, we discard them, but we have to look at them like an ekimat. Ekimat was raised out in the desert, but God lifted him up and he brought him to different places. Ekimat's going to be a leader. We don't know how many of these are going to be leaders. And that's how we have to look at them is, yeah, they're dirty and they smell, but one day they're going to be a leader. They're, God is going to do something in their lives. And again, this is uh, just me out in this uh, place that we had never drilled before and uh, they're planting a church there so we sent our Jesus video team out there and we come alongside the pastor and he wants to you know everybody to introduce themselves so everybody's got to speak so if you ever come with me to Kenya be ready to speak and uh, stuff and again Ekimat's by my side translating like right now so it was, uh, it was really a, a, just a great trip to see how God is moving. And uh, as long as we keep moving forward, he's going to keep giving us more of the picture. So the ripple effect. This is just a few. Was that blurry the whole time? Or is it just that picture? So this is just a few of the pictures of people that you know, we have touched, but when you really look at it, we've been touched too, right? The, the effect goes both ways. Like God has changed my heart when, uh, you know, when I got saved, uh, I can honestly say that I wasn't a very nice guy. And um, now I think I'm a bit better, right, honey? <laughs> she still says I'm a little blunt sometimes, but that's good. It's a good thing, isn't it? So... You know, I, basically these people are part of the ripple effect. And I guess my challenge would be, if you want to be a part of the ripple effect, let's just keep saying yes. Just keep in saying yes and taking that step forward. And see what God is going to do with the little things that you do. He will turn around and do great things. And then this last slide here. My wife. It really hasn't been easy for Laura. Uh, she doesn't like being home for a month at a time. Um, but she has enabled me to go and say yes to God by her saying yes. So, thanks, honey. So this is just a few of the things that, you know, we're always in need of projectors, a way to, to show the, the Jesus video, school fees. We'd like to get two more motorcycles for our, uh, our Jesus video team right now. They're on a little 100 with all their equipment and two guys. So it's a little crowded when you're going 100 kilometers out into the desert. So whenever we can, uh, if they're traveling with the... Uh, the drilling team will throw all their equipment, so then they just have to ride two on a motor, but, but that's still pretty uncomfortable. And, uh, yeah, the churches, basically, to get them all completed and the floors done and stuff is about 20000 And, uh, yeah, constant repairs. I mean, that's one thing about the water run, as you guys all are aware. Uh, the Schmids are always involved in the, the, the water run. And that's, it pays for all those things that we don't have the money to do. And so come in October, when they come and knock on your door and say, hey, do you want to support the water run? Just say yes. <laughs> that was a good intro, eh? So, but thank you guys so much for having me here. Uh, you know, when you're praying, you just pray for God to just keep moving us forward. Uh, I don't know where we're going. Uh, one of the, my biggest things is, 
and Doug and I talked about it this morning, and Larry and I talk about it all the time, is uh, if something happens to me, what's going to happen to the ministry? So that's my prayer. God, raise up a young, somebody young, a family that has uh, the, the mindset to say yes and, and move forward. So thanks for inviting me, Trevor, and you guys have a blessed day. So now you know this is another part of where you get a chance to help support. And we, we've been praying for them, and now you know you get to see them. And before we end, we're going to pray for him right now. And just to, just to remind you that we are, you can give into this extra uh, right now. We're going to be handing out, we're going to, at the end of the month, I'm not sure exactly how we're going to work this, Jan, but uh, when you give and you, and you designate it, then we're going to the different groups that we support. And if today, if you want to just give into this ministry, then make, make sure you put down the Nehemiah construction and then we're going to give into that. So it's a chance for you to be a part, a small part, but still a part to touch people's lives. I get so excited when we get to do this. So let me, we're just going to pray for Dave this morning and uh, just commit this. Father, I thank you for what you have done. God, we don't know the small things that we say yes to, that you choose to use to touch so many. And Father, I thank you for the privilege that we have to support Dave and Nehemiah Construction. And as we continue to help, even with this water run in October, God, I just pray, Lord, would you bless it? Prepare the people are ready to be there. Lord, open the windows of heaven. Let the, the blessing fall in. Lord, to be able to reach more and touch more people that they might receive and that they might be um, equipped to do all that you've called them to do. Lord, we pray together for this uh, one that would rise up under Dave. Now, Father, that he would be able to uh, pass this ministry over to. Lord, as, uh, you have someone already picked. You've already started. And God, I just pray, bring him in. Bring him into that place. And Lord, I just pray that they would have that heart, that same heart, that same DNA for what you want to do. And Lord, let it be. And Lord, we look forward to hearing what you're going to do. And Lord, help each one of us to say yes to those things that you've asked. And that, Lord, we don't worry, Lord, because you are our provider. You're the one that does it. So, God, right now, we just, again, pray your blessing on Dave and Laura. Thank you again for the privilege. And bless us now, Lord, as we leave this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You are dismissed.